This morning, notice your sermon title that is there. Guaranteed healing or what? Your money back. Guaranteed healing or your money back. Now, this is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek um, because uh, we live in a day and time when Christians are often confused um, about some of these issues. Since about uh, 1900, there's been a lot of confusion come into the evangelical church concerning um, this issue and concerning the idea of healing. And it even comes very often one of the main texts that it comes from is the text that we've just been studying here at the end of the book of James. And so it's my prayer this morning that we would be able to look at what this means and what it likely does mean, what it likely does not mean, but most of all, remember the big picture that God has for us. The fact of the matter is, is that we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world where there is sin, where there is suffering, where there is evil, where there is hate, where there is disease, and eventually where there is death. This is part of the fall. This last week, precious Barbara Steen laid in a hospital bed there in the Steen's home. And hour after hour, day after day, she struggled to breathe. Tuesday evening, several of the pastors and the lay leaders of the church gathered together, and we gathered around her bedside. And we had one of the most sweet moments of praying for and lifting up the heart and the mind and the soul, body of Pastor Fred and Barbara. It was their 53rd wedding anniversary. And they renewed their vows Tuesday evening. A man drove all the way, John Fleming drove all the way from Alabama to renew their, to, to read their vows together. And we gathered around them. Well, we kind of thought for sure probably on Wednesday Barbara would pass away, but it wasn't Wednesday and it wasn't Thursday. Eventually, here at the end of the week, just yesterday, she, at 11 o'clock, stopped breathing. In the course of that, as Fred and I sat there and considered this, I said, you know, Fred, and, and Barbara's, Barbara's death has taught me some things about my theology. You know, each time when you go to a wedding, you ought to learn something. Weddings are important. Covenant is important. When a baby is born, you ought to learn something. When there is a death and there's a life that is, that is going through that transition to death, you ought to learn something. You ought to consider your life and learn something. As I was deeply praying for Fred and Barbara, it occurred to me that Barbara was struggling to, believe, to, to live and to breathe because that's what God designed her body to do. God designed her to live. I want you to think about this. God designed us for life. He did not design us for death. If you really think through the process of Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and then coming up to Genesis 3, what happens in Genesis 3? The fall. Very good. Many of you said the fall. Our fall into sin, and here comes the first death into creation after sin. So the fall is a big deal. And as Pastor Fred and as many of you, and now even yesterday, Friday morning, Jim Goff, after a long, long, painful battle, Jim Goff suddenly passed away Friday morning. And once again, with Sharon yesterday, we were sitting there talking, and I said, Sharon, it's interesting that this struggle that we have in life is all about how God designed us for life, but when we sinned and we entered into the fall, here comes suffering, sickness, and death. And Christians need to understand this. 
Christians need to understand that the human design is for life, and God's design is for life. There's no doubt about that. And part of what we see in the, in the work of God through his people, that God has the power over sickness and death. In the Old Testament, we see healings and we see life. We see even some raised from the dead. This is showing that God is the God of power over death. He's saying, look at who I am. I'm the creator of all things. And even in your state of fallenness, even in your state of death, listen, I can bring life. And so we see that in the Old Testament and we see it in the New Testament. And it's, even as we were preaching through the book of John, we see this very, very clearly that even the week before Jesus himself would go to the cross, and be laid in a tomb and rise again, we see that very thing as far as death goes and life coming from death with Lazarus. Jesus' own dear friend Lazarus dies and Jesus raises him from the dead and a week later it is Jesus showing us that. So this morning I want us to see this and um, James deals with it. We need to deal with it. We have experienced it even this week as we look at this. For some of you, you, uh, you have received bad news on your, med on your medical. Um, for some of you, you're dealing with things that no one else knows about yet. And you're, for some of you, you're wondering, how is this going to turn out? What is it that God wants to do with this? And I pray that this morning that we would be encouraged. Let's remember the main text that is here, and then we will look. In James chapter 5 and verse 13, we see these parting words, the words as we're getting near to the very end of James. This is probably the next to the last message of this great book. But look at James chapter 5 and verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Do what? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We looked at what that possibly means and what it probably doesn't mean last Sunday. You can go back and look at that in verse 15. This is our focus this morning. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power as it is working. And he gives an example from the Old Testament. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Verse 18, then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. James is touching on this issue of suffering. Look in the, re look in the review and context very quickly. I've, I've left many of these full so you can see them and just be reminded, try to remember over the last two Sundays what we have studied. Look at verse 1. We must recognize the, what, did we, what do we have underlined there? The, the reality of suffering in a fallen world. There's many who don't want to recognize that reality um, as, as blatant as it is. Look at the next bullet point there. The issue of pain and suffering is often a tremendous stumbling block, both for non-Christians and for Christians. There's many who will say, because of the suffering of the world, I, I have a hard time believing, or what is it that God is doing in this? Next bullet point. Strong, mature Christians typically have a solid what? A solid theology of suffering. That's what mature Christians develop over a period of time if they're going to be mature, because it's such a real issue. Look at the next part there. Our fall into sin resulted in separation, suffering, and death. And we looked from Genesis 3 all the way to Romans 6, 23, that says, for the wages of sin is death. And that's talking about both physical death and spiritual death, as we'll see in a few moments. In this fallen state, God sovereignly uses pain and suffering to do three things, to bring us to him, to grow us in him, and to keep us in him. So he uses what Satan has meant for evil, as we saw with the life of Joseph, he uses it for good. God comes and works through these circumstances, and we see that in Psalm 119 and 2 Corinthians. Look at number two. Christians are to face the circumstances of life with faith-filled prayer. 
fill that in, with faith-filled prayer. That's what Christians are supposed to do. That is what, what James is saying. That's the big picture of this passage, is that James is saying, if you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful and things are going great, pray. If you're, if you're sick, perhaps about to die, pray. Each point we pray. Number three, part of the big point of this text is that God powerfully answers faith-filled prayer in accordance with his word. In accordance with his word, in accordance with his will, those two are really synonymous. Look at number four. We need to recognize a few things regarding sin and uh, suffering and sickness. And notice that there's some things that God does. God always, God often, God sometimes, God never. Letter A, God always rewards our pursuit of him. He's a rewarder of those who seek him, Hebrews eleven six. Letter B, God often has purposes and plans, purposes and plans that what? We do not see. Now that, you ought to put a star next to that one. That is important. Now I use the word often there. Notice what that statement is. God often has purposes and plans that we do not see. Should we have the word there, God always has purposes and plans that we do not see? No. There are sometimes we, we are able to see what God is doing through our trouble. Now, he always has a purpose and a plan, always. But the other side of it is this. Sometimes we know what it is, and that's a great blessing, and sometimes we don't know what it is. We ought to rejoice when we see, when we know what it is, and when we don't see it and we don't understand it, we need to trust him, and we need to trust him big. Notice the next one there, letter C. God sometimes grants our direct requests. Sometimes he, we're asking something very specifically and he grants that request. But you know what? You can be like Garth Brooks. Thank God sometimes for unanswered prayers. Have you ever heard that song? Go home and listen to it. Country and Western by Garth Brooks, a little bit of good theology. Very strange thing. But, I mean, the picture is, you know, that you better, you better hope that God doesn't give you everything you ask for. Because sometimes you're going to ask for things that you shouldn't have. And so we see these, these beautiful pictures of God's sovereignty. Letter D, God never misses an opportunity to reveal his glory and grow our faith, to reveal his glory and to grow our faith. He's always going to do it. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And we need, be, we need to submit to that. Now let's look on the back side and let's see um, what this passage may or may not mean. In verse 15, um, we see something here. Look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. All one has to do is go home and turn on one of about five or six Christian television stations. And it's not only on Christian television, but it can be in many, many different churches in many, many different groups gathering, not only in these counties that are right here in South Florida, but all around the world, where there is often great confusion over these matters, and, an, and a not, not a very careful look at these matters, and quite honestly, a very, very sensationalized and manipulative look at these matters. And it's across the board very often. Um, we studied recently the book of Jude, and we looked at the apostate preachers who will come preaching the gospel for their own gain. They will preach the gospel, um, declaring power, but denying it in the way that they live their lives. And the idea is they proclaim the great and glorious holy power of God in one way, but then they live in their own lives a different way, and they come preaching the gospel either 
for financial gain or they come preaching the gospel for sexual um, appeasement and control or they come preaching the gospel for status and power. And so we live in a day and time not only with modern television where many of that began to be really, really broadcast in the 1950s, but it was also during this time that the average Christian family began to be more busy working more and more busy with the hubbub of modern society than they were of studying the Word of God. And so there became a time and a movement not only within um, American Christianity but also other developed nations where we started to see largely a great deal of ignorance about what God's Word really says. And so when convincing preachers, when very manipulative, powerful, persuasive preachers come along playing on people's senses, promising things that will be satisfying to either the desire for signs and wonders or the desires for the alleviation of pain or, listen, or desires for the things of this world, a prosperity gospel, many, many people just gulped it in. So the prosperity gospel the name it, claim it, health, wealth, God wants you to be happy, God wants you to be healthy, God wants you to be wealthy, theology sounded very good to a lot of people, and they drank it in. What we begin to see when we really study carefully the Word of God, we begin to see, wait a minute, no, God is working in the pain. God is using the difficulty. And some of God's greatest blessings may be your poverty. Or one of God's greatest blessings may be your pain. We see that expressly, overtly in the life of the Apostle Paul, perhaps one of the greatest men of faith ever to live on the earth. Three times he asked that this pain, this trouble, whatever it was, would be removed from him. And the answer came back very clear, no, this is my grace for you. This is to keep you from exalting yourself. Trust me, Paul. And so he would later write, even in prison, I'm, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. Knowing that God is in control, knowing that his plan is in full play. So, it is important for us in this day and time when there is such great hysteria um, that we see that we indeed serve the creating God. That is the ultimate powerful God. That is the ultimate God of power and miraculous might. He can do whatever he chooses to do, whenever he chooses to do it. And as we come to know him and trust him when he does do what we ask and learn to trust him when he doesn't do what we ask, then we come to see who he really is. So is this verse, verse 15, a quid pro quo, which means a this for that. That, that means an automatic response. It's a trade. You know, you hear about uh, perhaps people giving politicians uh, large sums of money for some, you know, thing that they're doing, and they say, you know, it's a quid pro quo deal. You know, you give money and the politician does what you wanted to do. There's a lot of different ways that we see quid pro quo used in legal society or in modern vernacular, modern things, but is this an automatic response from God? Notice here with me in verse 15, is this a quid pro quo of promise of immediate physical, underline that, physical healing from God. Is that what James is saying? And I'm going to say to you, not likely, and here is why. Here's a few of the reasons why. Number one, this is likely not just an immediate quid quo, pro quo promise of immediate physical healing, because 
If it was, if it was primarily a literal promise that would be for Christian, excuse me, there would be Christians who are 1,975 years old. Does anybody know a Christian that's 1,975 years old? No. Does anyone know a Christian that is 1,000 years old? No. Does anybody know a Christian that's 500 years old? Does anybody know a Christian that's 200 years old? Does anybody know a Christian that's 150? No. I mean, we're at an auction here. Um, 100. Some of you know somebody that's about 100. That's about, I, I know a Christian that's 100. Mr. Eshelman. Mrs. Eshelman, remind me. He lived to be 100 and, he lived to be, Mr. Eshelman lived to be 102 years of age. We loved him. Man of God. Went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. But you know, the fact of the matter is, we don't know Christians that are much more than about 100 years old. So, if this was a quid pro quo promise, certainly there would be people of faith enough around, the, at least somewhere within the billions of people, that there would be some Christians that are 200, 300, 400 years old. I mean, when, when does death come? Now, it's interesting. I, my, my daughter is a nurse. Um, she's about to start this week at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital as a pediatric nurse. And we were talking even last night, and I said, Cheryl, do death certificates say... Um, passed away from old age? Do, do death, or, she said no. She said there's always a, a basically a, a reason that is given. It's heart failure. Or it is um, some other issue that is there, pneumonia, or some other infectious disease, or some other degenerative disease. But we, we don't just say, now it's the news reports that say, well this person died of natural causes. But that's not what death certificate. When you look at it scientifically, it's because eventually something failed. Eventually something gave up. Eventually there wasn't enough strength. There was a degeneration of the strength of the heart or the strength of the, or the condition of the lungs or the ability of the kidneys or the ability of the liver. Eventually something eventually comes down to a point of failure that brings catastrophic result, which is death. And so, what we recognize is, is that we live in a world where there is true faith. We live in a world where there are God's works and His movement and His might that is around us, but we also see that we live in a world where part of our faith is trusting God in sickness and in death. And, and we just need to come to realize that that's part of this present life of faith that we come to. Now, there's another important thing that I want you to see here that, that would help us to say, no, this is not a quid pro quo, direct promise for healing. I mean, the, just the fact that there's not people that, that have never died since this was said. But look at number two. The terms and timing. These are two important concepts. The terms and timing of healing in the Bible often refer to our final state in glory. Now, I'm going to explain that. And I want you to start to enter into this thought with me. The terms and timing of healing in the Bible often refer to our final state in glory. In the Old Testament, God is saying, Israel, I'm going to rescue you. Israel, I am going to set you free. Now, part of that is in the reference to them being in bondage under another, under another country or them being in trouble, there, there being difficulty for them, and God is going to redeem them out of that. So part of that is the physical, the physical relief that Israel would be promised, God's people would be promised in the Old Testament. But we know that all that God was doing in the Old Testament was pointing to eternity. He's pointing to what I'm going to do in the long run with you. He's pointing to the fact that eventually it's, I'm going to save you out of this world of fallen sin. And I, I mean, it's going to sound too good to be true, but I'm going to bring you into the original state of eternal life. We're going to go back to pre-fall. 
We're going to go back to pre-fall state where there is no sickness, there is no sorrow, there is no death, there are no more tears. And so part of what God is doing as he's dealing with us, whether it's Old Testament or even in the New Testament, even in the life of Jesus, is he's saying, I have the power to do, to deliver on the long-term promise. I have the power, and I'm going to show you that. Lame man, get up and walk. Blind man, see. Deaf man, hear. Widow's son at Nain, rise up. Lazarus, come forth. I'm God. I can promise this. But I want you to learn to trust me. And so, what we see in this whole message of the Bible, and the whole message, even from James, as you're going to see here, you're going to see that these The timing of when the healing is going to be. Sometimes it's right now. I mean, for Lazarus, it was right then. Lazarus, rise up. But you know what? Lazarus is not still alive today. Eventually, Lazarus died again. (laughs) He's one of those few people with the distinct privilege of dying twice. You say, well, I guess there's a special reward for him in heaven. I believe there is, heaven in itself. But notice here with me, letter A, when it comes to this, Yes, conversion and faith now. God offers to us conversion, and he offers to us the the privilege of living in faith now. That is for certain. That will happen 100% of the time when someone repents of his sin, believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, as we just said in the starting point group, transfers trust from my works to Christ's work. Now that, that, is, a, that is a given. He promises that that's exactly what's going to happen. Look at with me, letter A, yes, conversion and faith now, but notice this next one, salvation and restoration to come. Now, what he's saying is, is that you're going to be saved. Part of your salvation is a future event that is yet to occur. You may have been converted to me now. You may have become my child now, but you're still living in a world of sin and death. And so you're mine, and you're safe but you're still going to live in a world of sin and death, and you're still going to pass through the transition from life in this world of sin and death to life eternal. You're still going to go through a physical death, but Jesus said, if any man believe in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And he is talking about ultimate resurrection. So he's talking about a salvation that is to come. And not only, listen to this, and you can just shout and glory hallelujah on this, but one day these earthly bodies with all of their trouble are going to be replaced with a glorious, perfect body. Can you say amen to that? How many look forward to that? You look forward to that? I look forward to that. I mean, I, some of you think you have a perfect body now. Uh. Yeah, well, too bad. Maybe, maybe yours is not going to be quite as great. I don't know. But, I mean, don't, don't, I mean, listen. There is some, you know, man looks on the outside. God looks on the inside. These physical bodies, they are important to God. But listen, they can be a great distraction from living by faith. Um, if all we do is care about how we look and we obsess about now, I think we ought to look decent and presentable that's part of the way you respect others is by dressing decent and respectable and and looking like you care what who they are and you we're respectful to one another but beyond that we're not to be obsessed with this earthly life there's so much more notice that the restoration is going to come, that we are going to have new bodies in him, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and it is going to be glorious. We studied this when we studied worldview. Creation, fall, what? Redemption, and then the last one is 
glory, creation, fall, redemption, and glory. And so that's, that's where we're headed. Put out there to the side, heaven, out there to the side of glory. Some of you are wondering, what, what is glory? That, it's talking about heaven or the final state. So letter B, throughout God's word, God is almost always leading us to look beyond our physical, temporal, that means temporary, earthly lives. I want you to get this. When we, when we see God working in Old Testament saints, we see Christ come, pay for our, pri- pay our, our sin price, and then we are now living as the church in the New Testament era. That's where we are now in this time. We see that God all the way through the process is calling us moving us, leading us to look beyond the physical, temporal, earthly lives to, fill this in, our spiritual, eternal, or heavenly life with him. God, it, it is his goal to help raise your sights, to look in faith to what he ultimately has for you. Now, here, here's part of the problem. People who have never been converted to Christ, people who are not true Christians, they don't have the truth and the power in their hearts to look to the eternal. They're not going to understand eternal matters. They're not going to understand spiritual things. There's some things that are there and there's other things that they do, but they're just, they don't have spiritual eyes yet. We see throughout the New Testament that the Apostle Paul writes and even Jesus writes about the fact that the conversion process to Christ brings an understanding of the things of God. And that doesn't mean that you, can't, that you just suddenly, the moment you get saved, you understand all spiritual truths. Some of you think that that's what happened when you got saved. You're still figuring out that you don't know it all. You don't understand it all. And, and you say, well, that preacher, does he think that? Well, no, I would say, no, there's a lot that I do not understand. There's a lot that I'm still working on to understand. But the base things I know and by God's grace, in his, by his spirit within us, that we can see spiritual truths. And so God is always calling us to move to that in our life. Your spiritual growth, it, it is God's goal for you to grow in your faith, for you to grow in your understanding. And one of the ways that we do that is by spending time in his word and by learning to apply his word to our lives. And very often that's through sickness and suffering and even death. And so notice here with me that this is a big goal of God. And we even see it in verse 15. Look at verse, letter C, look at letter C. Some key words in verse 15, notice these key words in verse 15, because it's very interesting. It, up there in verse 15, notice and circle the word up there, save. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Now, notice this next part, it'll be a little bit hard for you to circle it because it's on two lines, but we'll raise him up, raise him up. Okay, is that talking about physical? Is that talking about spiritual? What, What is that? And then look at the next word there toward the end of verse 15. He says, will be what? Forgiven. Now, I want you to see that James is doing what Jesus does. James is talking about physical things, but more so under an understanding of much more important spiritual things. So we're confused maybe, what is James talking about? We pray for this guy and everybody's gonna get up and walk, everybody's gonna come up off of their, what seemed to be their deathbed? And no, and we could, we could say, no, wait a minute, James is also talking about, they're gonna be saved from their sin. They're gonna be saved from hell. And and look at the next part. They're going to be raised up. They may die now, but as Jesus said, they're going to live again. Though they die, yet shall they live. They're going to be raised up. And then look at the big need. What's our biggest need? Is our biggest need to to be free from sickness? No, our biggest need is to be free from sin. They're going to be forgiven. So do you see those three words in here? So are, is it only talking about the physical? No, but like the apostle Peter and like the Lord Jesus himself and like we see throughout the Old Testament, there are things that apply to now, but they're all foreshadowing of what the big issue is, is our spiritual lives. 
I, I, this is so clear in 1 Peter. I want you to see 1 Peter. I was so blessed as I was reading this this week. I want you to see 1 Peter. It's important enough that I printed both of these passages on your outline because I want you to see it in one translation all together. By the way, that's, why, that's one of the reasons I encourage you to buy an ESV Bible. Um, we sell them in the bookstore. When we read large passages, it's so much easier if you're going to read it out of the Bible. Um, the, if your translation is the same or really, really similar, that's, that's the re- reason we do that. But notice 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable. You see, that's heaven is coming you're going to receive the inheritance of heaven in grace. So what he says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, it's undefiled. And look what it is. It's unwhat. It's fading. It's never going to fade away. Your earthly life may fade away, but your eternal life is never going to fade away. And notice where this promise is held. Where is it? It's kept in heaven for you. Are you in heaven yet? No. But it's this promise, the ultimate promise is being kept in heaven for you. And this is written to people who are under persecution. This is written to people who are in trouble, 1 Peter. Look at verse 5. Who by God's power are being, he's talking about you guys who are saved, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now... For a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Do you see the difference in the timing? There's the timing of the here and now, and it's all these passages, these promises, they are all pointing to the ultimate timing of God's long-term salvation and beauty and glory in this. Look at verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith. See, that's what God is doing. He's testing your faith. He's working in your faith. He's building your faith. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's to come. Look at verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you what? You love him. How do you do that? You do that by faith. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. What is it? That means faith. You're believing in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, it's, it's impossible to be saved without faith, not in yourself, not in your grandfather who was a Baptist preacher, not in Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, but it's impossible to be saved without faith, belief in Jesus Christ. This is how our sins are forgiven. This is how the real healing happens. This is how the gates of heaven are opened. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. And this time now on earth is getting us ready for that time that is to come. And so, while we may be converted to Christ now, in faith, we're trusting in the promises that God has made. And that pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And so, God wants your faith to grow. God wants you to become a mature Christian who trusts what He said. Now, you can't trust what He said if you don't know what He said, which is why we study the Bible. And it's why you ought to read your Bible. It's why the Bible ought to be a central place in your home. The Bible is more important than CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, or any of the other factories of foolishness. I I just want to encourage you that this is the important news that we need to know and believe. This isn't fake news. This is real, true, reliable And this will bring the salvation of your soul. So just notice that. I mean, there's so many things that we talk about in that, that he's he's talking about spiritual language. He's talking about you're going through trouble now, but the great and the glorious salvation is to come. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 35 through 40. And notice in verse 35, Jesus is the one that is speaking. 
And Jesus gives us another hint of this. In verse 35, he says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now, he's talking about a physical thing, but he means so much more than, than just wheat. You understand that? He, he's talking about more than wheat. He's talking about not just the physical stuff. He's talking about the real substance of life. You guys, we got to get that. We had to get that God is always wanting to raise our vision beyond the here and now. And, and here we see it. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Now, he, he, sure, I mean, part of this is that God's going to take physically care of his own, and, but we know that sometimes Christians are hungry. Sometimes Christians starve to death. Lottie Moon, one of the great missionaries um, of Southern Baptist Life. We have an offering that's named after her that we're going to take in a few months for world missions. Lottie Moon died of starvation outside of Kobe, Japan on a ship on Christmas Eve over 100 years ago. So, so notice here with me, Jesus is talking about more than the physical life. Look at what he says in verse 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. That means, man, if you hear God's voice calling you, you run to him. He will not cast you away. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter how messed up you are. This is the God who can raise you from the dead. He can forgive your sins. He can heal your heart and your hurts. He says, all who come to me, I will no wise cast out. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Here again, we see that same thing from James, that they are going to be raised up. The big picture. Look at verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And then he says it again. Let's read it out loud. And I will raise him up on the last day. That's the promise. We just sung about the promise. That we stand on the promise. God wants us to see so far beyond your cancer. He wants you to see so far beyond your macular degeneration. He wants you to see so far beyond, listen, even some of the other things that even hurt more, broken relationships, failed opportunities, missed opportunities. The agony of defeat in various things in your life. He, he, he wants us to see that by faith we go through these things in a fallen world and we keep our eyes on him and we learn to trust his heart when we cannot understand his hand. So all through this passage we see that there's so much more than a quid pro quo promise to heal there's so much more, and James is just drilling down into that. Notice this at the bottom. I want you to see this. Like his half-brother, the Lord Jesus. So Pastor James's half-brother was Jesus himself. Um, they were both sons of Mary, okay? So Pastor James, the guy who wrote this, was one of the brothers who didn't even really follow Jesus while he was here. He didn't follow him until later, which is, there's beauty in all of that. But like his half-brother, the Lord Jesus, James is calling us to live lives, fill it in, of fervent faith and faithfulness. Both of those. Fervent faith and faithfulness. Throughout the book of James, we've talked about this issue. It's the next line that is here. He is concerned that our faith and our works go together. That we actually trust and obey. We see that throughout the letter. 
He's saying if you're truly a Christian, you're not just going to believe the right things, but it's going to show in the way you live. If you're truly a Christian, you're gonna, your, your tongue is not going to be just, just out of control. The Lord is going to control your tongue. You, you're not just going to say and say, well, that's just the way I am. You're not, you're not going to sit there and, and love other, some people and hate others. You're not going to do that if you're truly a Christian. If you're truly a Christian, you're going to look to the Lord when times are hard. You're going to trust in Him. It may be hard. It may be tested. and You may be stretched, but that's what you're going to do. Look at these, and, and I just ask you these as we close this morning for application in your own life. The first one is ask yourself, do I live in belief in what God has said? Do I live in belief? And, I, and I'm asking you, do, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that he is in control of the circumstances that are around you and that you can trust in him? Do you believe that? Oh, I call you to believe in that. And then the next one is maybe part of what James is really drilling at is do you live in obedience to what God has said? Do you live in obedience? Do you obey? Do you do what he said? Jesus said, many say to call me Lord, but they do not the things that I say. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I command you. He who keeps my commandments are the, are the one who loves me. My question to you this morning is, have you stepped over into belief and faith in Christ? that he is your only hope? And my question is, does your life reflect in the way that you live, do, the way that you act at work, the way that you live at home, the decisions that you make, with your morality, the decisions that you make with your business, the decisions that you make with your children, the decisions that you make, do they reflect what God has said to do?